So we're here, uh, this is our Summerville by Design Complete Streets series. And um, again, the mayor had a very ambitious um, pre, or excuse me, midterm address this year where he talked about wanting to make Somerville the most walkable, bikeable community in America. And in order to facilitate that, you have to bring in and think about innovative design and what it means to the community. And we thought, considering that Somerville is already well on its way and one of the most livable places in America, we needed to enlist the help of what is arguably the most forward thinker on what complete streets are. So we have brought to you for the next three months Ian Lockwood. We're going to spend time tonight talking about, bless you, what a complete street is and why it is integral to making Somerville a great place to live, work, play, and raise a family. And um, additionally, we're going to talk through uh, ways to illustrate what a complete street is. And then we'll um, reach out to you in a more charrette-based form over the next uh, couple of meetings. And then we'll um, have information for you to report out on Earth Day, um, Mar excuse me, April 22nd. So with that, um, I want to back up and give you a little bit of background on who Ian Lockwood is. I uh, did a little bit of research on uh, Ian, looked up his bio, and it was filled with phrases like smart growth, context-sensitive design, complete streets, improving places, and quote, making strong connections between the built form and community health. And all of these things sound wonderful, and again, they sound important for making a great place. But maybe we haven't really talked about how all of those things can be incorporated in good design and executed in Somerville. And so that is where we start here today. Um, just as an aside, recently um, the Atlantic City blog online had a um, top 10 trends they hope, the top 10 urban trends they hope die in 2013. And the first one was something that I like to term a concept of unimodalism, which is they talked about bikers fighting pedestrians, transit users um, fighting motorists, and so on and so on. Maybe through all of this we can start thinking about what a complete street is and why it's good for all of us just to learn to get along and, what, and, and designing things that can make that easier for everyone. So. Before I bring Ian up, I have to sing his, his praises through his resume. Um, Ian has helped reform movements at several state departments of transportation through policy work, training, guideline preparation, and leading projects. In recent years, Ian has helped various public health organizations make stronger connections between the built form and community health. One of Ian's projects was awarded the Institute of Transportation and Engineers 2009 Project of the Year. The project was integrated transportation and land use plan in New Jersey that stopped a major freeway from being built through a developing area near a small town. By working with a myriad of stakeholders and developers and planning a network of two-lane context-sensitive street designs, the project was well received by the public, developed the development community, and New Jersey DOT. The project saved the state money, avoided damaging wetlands, historic farms, and resulted in a walkable place that connected the open space system. So, as you can see, he's done some amazing work throughout uh, the United States, and we welcome him here to Somerville. Uh, I hope that all of you are as excited as I am for the next three months. Thank you very much. Again, thanks for coming out. I'm going to um, hopefully share with you a whole bunch of ideas. It's going to come at you very quickly and then we'll have lots of time after to, to chat about it. We could talk about any one of these little things for the entire night. So um, it would be really easy to get stuck in the weeds and let's hopefully we won't do that until maybe the end we can get into some depth on something. Um, but before we start, um, I'd like to find out who's here, you know, like your backgrounds. Like I know there's some professors, right? Well, welcome. Um, so we're going to talk about complete streets, and it's kind of hard to talk about complete streets in a vacuum, so because there's overlap with lots of other things. But um, I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit more. I grew up in a place called Ottawa, Canada, and 
as a child, I could ride my bike anywhere in the city um, easily. And I just thought all cities were like that. Uh, you could go downtown as a 10-year-old you know, by yourself you know, perfectly safely and, and walk around. And it's a, it's a big city. And, and I just assumed everywhere was like that until I started traveling. And then I did um, the velodrome thing. I'm a, I'm a cyclist. I ride about, when I'm at home, about 200 miles or so a week. Um, I just love cycling. I, I came to work on bike. I, um, I go on vacation on bike. I, I used to do the triathlon thing, and there, there's my rollers for training. And then when I'm not riding my bike, I, I still commute on two wheels if I'm going a, a long way or something. And I invented a, uh, a little propeller bike. It pushes you along, gets about 160 miles to the gallon. Um, kind of cool bike. And then when I go on vacation, I, I like to ride my bike. So I kind of define myself as a, a cyclist. Um, and so, oh, and I raise money for good causes by riding century rides like probably several of you do. And then when I design projects, I try and design them to include cyclists and, and pedestrians and the active modes of transportation. And then I do a lot of awareness work with um, politicians and so forth. And, and I had the honor in 2005 to be part of the group who, who gathered in Washington to d define complete streets. And so for a couple of days, we talked about what it meant. And in a nutshell, it really meant to be inclusive, to, to allow all the different street users to be able to use the space uh, equitably and comfortably. Um, there were some people in the group who, who thought it meant putting bike lanes on every street. <coughs> but as you see in a moment, that's not what it meant. Um, so there's all these misinterpretations of what complete streets is, but basically it's just to be inclusive and allow people to, to use the public space comfortably. Oh, and my biggest honor was I was the skinny Santa in the Christmas parade one year. And the idea was that if you walked or used a bike, even, even Santa could shed a few pounds, you know, for. It was about uh, fitness. So conventionally, we were all about accommodating uh, trucks and buses and cars and so forth. And more recently, we're getting into accommodating the cyclists and pedestrians, well, the, the kids. And we call those the mobile street users, the, the people who move up and down or across the, the streets. But I also think there's a role for what we call the, the static um, street users, the institutions, the recreational areas, the, the homes, and, and they have a, a, a direct relationship to the, to the street as well. And so I'd like to think a little more broadly than just the, the folks who move with re regard to completeness. And the, and the green and the, the red uh, groups there are what I call the vulnerable users. The more the street resembles a highway, the, the less respect those groups get. And so the idea is to, to alter the design to be you know, inclusive of the, of the needs of those, other, of those other groups. And of course, there's all sorts of different types of street users. Um, so it all depends on the context, what happens to be you know, present at the time. So here's an analogy for you. Here's a, a large house. Yeah, it's expensive, it's big, it takes a lot of maintenance. And, and there's rooms for everything in that house. There's, um, there's a kitchen, there's a a walk-in pantry, there's a breakfast area, there's a formal dining room, there's a study, and so, so all the things that happen in that house theoretically are separated by both time and space. You move around to these different places to do different things. And behind, at the end of that arrow, there's a window, and behind that window there's an efficiency apartment. All the same functions happen in that apartment, but they're only separated in time. They all exist in the same space. The space is shared amongst all the activities. And here's a, a street, and there's um, a space for everything on this street, for walking, for trees, for benches, for parking cars, for cycling, for driving, for turning left. So it's kind of like the big house. You know, there's a, things are separated by space. Activities are separated by space. So we've got different housing types, and we have this sort of fixed use thinking where each space has its own fixed use, and then we have a multiple use space, which is the efficiency apartment. In streets, we have a fixed use thinking as well, where every, every use gets its own piece of the right of way. 
But what happens when you don't have the space where there's constraints? And, and, that's, <laughs> and that's the tricky part. You either build an incomplete street where you don't accommodate one user group, or you share parts of the space amongst uh, a variety of uses, or you share the entire space. So those are our options. And so we're going to be talking about a lot of that um, stuff on the bottom, how to accommodate all the users in different ways. Here's a, a, a highway, and that street is supposed to be a main street. And so we worked with all the business people and, and so forth on a different section to enclose the drainage and actually build a, a main street. Now the right-of-way is 100 feet. It's enormously wide space for a two-lane street. So we used up the space in all sorts of ways. So there's the safety parking where you, you back into the space. And then there's a, um, a furniture tree zone and then a, then a sidewalk and then concrete bike lanes. Um, and the, the, the thing about this particular project, the water table was really high, so we had to be very careful about how we handled stormwater. So you can see all the bio swales to handle the, the stormwater. But we managed to use up the 100 feet in a creative way where it, it felt at the right scale and, and, and accommodated all the user groups. Now here are two streets. They're both 30 feet wide. Uh, this one has sidewalks. This one doesn't. Uh, this one's actually nice to cycle on. There's no bike facilities, but it's uh, very bikeable. Um, so I would call that a complete street. This has no sidewalks. Um, it's the same width, the same buildings, but it's not very friendly to ride your bike on or walk on. So I would, I would call that an incomplete street. This has no sidewalks or bike lanes, um, but it's perfectly comfortable to ride your bike and walk and drive and is just a, um, a narrow street, nicely enclosed with trees. So that's a complete street. Complete doesn't mean that you have separate spaces for every use. It can be shared like this. So we've um, obsessed for several decades about accommodating uh, motorists and trucks and so forth. And, and we've expanded our thinking to try and think about these other user groups. And we've developed all kinds of vocabulary for describing this stuff. And there's a lot of overlap uh, with them. So we're talking about complete streets, and kind of the, the thrust of that is whether it's automobile-oriented or inclusive or equitable. And then there's shared space, which you probably, if you're interested in this, you probably come across shared space, which means do you have fixed-use uh, spaces like we described earlier with prescribed behaviors in each space, or is the space mixed and we use um, sort of normal interhuman um, communication to, to navigate. Now there's a broader term called context sensitive solutions which includes both complete streets and shared space. And what that talks about is does the context drive the planning or the design rather than the, the classification of the road based on some kind of arbitrary hierarchy like this road happened to be called a minor arterial or an arterial or collector. Does the um, characteristics of a generic collector trump the context? And so context sensitive solution says no, the context is important and you have to design according to the context. <coughs> it's a term called smart transportation which um, kind of integrates land use and transportation planning at the same time. There's a whole safe routes to school thing which is really about complete streets, but aimed mostly at children around schools so they can bike and, and walk to school. And then there's traffic calming, which includes a lot of the things up above, which changes conventional design into what we call self-enforcing design that creates an equitable and safe street environment. So there's all these overlaps that creates an equitable and safe street environment. So there's all these overlaps between these things, and so while we're talking about complete streets, we're probably going to touch on a lot of these other areas. Now, you could use any one of those terms. If you want to look at a situation through a particular lens, <clears throat> I like to just think of what we're talking about as good, competent street design. Um, and, and you consider all those things simultaneously. Just a little about context. <clears throat> if you took a meat cleaver 
and cut through a, a, a town from the center all the way out to the farms, you will get what we call a transect. Has anybody been following the new urbanist transects ideas? A few of you? So to simplify it, a, a transect is if you, if you look at a, a cross-section like that through various lenses. And so in this lens, we'll look at uh, buildings. So chances are you're going to find buildings closer together and, and bigger in the urban areas, and less so in suburban areas, and very sparsely placed in, in rural areas. You'll see more pedestrians in urban areas, fewer in the suburbs, and maybe even none in the rural areas. The transect for trees is you, in urban areas, you see regularly spaced trees and grates. In rural areas, you see sort of forest. And in the suburbs, you see something in between. Lighting, you have dark in the rural areas, pedestrian scale lighting in the urban areas, and, and cobra heads in the suburbs. The quality of the, build, the paving materials, you'll see higher quality paving materials in urban areas and less so as you, as you go more and more rural. You'll find more formal edge treatments on streets in urban areas and, and more natural edge treatments as you go out. Speeds, you expect slow speeds in urban areas, high speeds in rural areas and medium speeds in the suburbs. Parking, you expect marked parking in um, urban areas, informal on-street parking in the suburbs, and then off-street parking in, in the rural areas. And then you expect wider sidewalks in urban areas, you know, five or six foot wide sidewalks in the suburbs, and perhaps nothing or just trails in the rural areas. And so what we have is if, you, if, you, if you're working in an urban context, you have an, an urban design vocabulary. And the idea is, is it's kind of like a package deal. These, all these things go together. In the suburbs, there's a kind of another package deal that goes together unless you're trying to urbanize it. And what happens sometimes is that the rural and suburban um, design vocabulary gets imported into cities, and that's where we have problems. For example, if the speeds are too high, or the scale of the lighting or the signs are too big, and we start getting friction between um, what we want in the city and what we're, what we're building. Now, the context is way bigger than just rural, suburban, and uh, urban. It includes all these other things, like the, the land use and the history and the scale, the climate, the, you know, whether it's hilly or not, and so forth. But one thing that we really need to keep in mind for complete streets and, and the related ideas is this idea of vision. Where the, the, important, the most important part of the context, in my mind, is where the community wants the place to go. Um, how does your neighborhood, Main Street, um, and so forth, how should it ought to be in the future? What, what's your vision? And that drives a lot of, of the thinking. You know, vision is how you imagine your city um, if it were hugely successful. And if you, if you want your city, neighborhood, or what have you, to be successful, there's, there's two things we find um, are important. You know, we, if you do enough of these projects, you see patterns. And one is a vision, a collective idea of where the place ought to be, and then predictability, a plan on how to achieve your vision you know, in the next five years, 20 years, 50 years, however long your, your vision goes. And you need both those ingredients to attract investment, uh, um, creative people, and so forth. Having a vision without a plan is a bit of a pipe dream. You need both. So that's the vision and that's the plan, and a feasible means to advance the vision. And this is kind of what we're up against. Um, in the 10s and 20s, 1910s and 20s, there, this whole idea of experts came out where, it, uh, you just got to read this, it's incredible. The goal of human labor and thought is efficiency, technical calculation in all respects is superior to human judgment. <laughs> In fact, human judgment cannot be trusted because it's plagued by laxity, ambiguity, and unnecessary complexities. Subjectivity is an obstacle to clear thinking. That which cannot be measured either does not exist or is of no value. The affairs of citizens are best guided and conducted by experts. And, and, you, and, and this, we allowed this to happen, particularly in transportation planning, where the experts said we had to build highways through cities, we had to speed up the streets, we had to do all these sorts of things. And the people, the community, didn't really like that too much. Um, Jefferson thought differently. If, if we don't 
think the public is not enlightened enough to exercise their control with wholesome discretion. The remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion. And so this is, this is important to, to, to do outreach and so forth so that the community has the vocabulary to talk about these issues amongst themselves and determine their own future of what their, their city and streets ought to look like. And so when we work on a complete street project or what have you, the idea is not to just inform people what's happening to them, but to actually involve them and collaborate and empower with them to work together on, on a uh, mutually agreeable outcome. I'd like to talk a little bit about modeling. Um, we use a lot of models at our firm um, for, for good, but they can also be used to obstruct. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So here's a model of the solar system <coughs> from a long time ago. And you can see that the Earth is in the center of the solar system and the sun and planets revolve around it. And the models to figure this out were really complicated and they were always fraught with some error because the, the central assumption was wrong. Now, get, if you get it right and the sun's in the center, the model starts to make sense. It's really quite easy to predict the order of the or the orbits of the planets. Now with modeling cities, we put the car in the center of our solar system and everything revolves around the car. It's very complicated, um, there's error, and it's probably because the central assumption isn't correct. So if we put the human being in the middle, the pedestrian, things start to make sense. And I think it, it, it makes sense to us on a human level and a community level. You don't have to be an expert to understand what it means to have a great neighborhood and a great community. Doesn't mean the cars aren't important, but they're not the most important thing. It's really people, that's what cities are about. Sometimes we hide behind our models to justify an um, uncomfortable position like uh, a road widening or a, a new bridge or something like that. Um, but it's no substitute for a vision. So to imagine your city as, a, as a, the city you want it to be and, and, and what the attributes are are more important than the output of, of a contradictory model. The, the models are actually quite, quite complex and, the, and the, the, the species they're modeling, of course, is the car. They don't, they, we don't model um, pedestrians. In, in these big transportation models. The uh, biologists, when they're looking at an equally complex system like wetlands, they don't try and model the whole thing. It's just too complicated, just like cities are too complicated. So they pick an indicator species, some, usually a frog or something like that. And if the frog's doing well, then the wetland's doing well. If the frog's doing bad, then there's something wrong and they can investigate. So we modeled cars. Now, if the cars are doing really well in the city, the assumption is that the city's doing well, and, and that's not exactly true. I think everybody can, can get that. It would be like modeling purple loosestrife or malaleuca in wetlands. And if that's doing really well, then the wetland is doing really well. They picked the wrong species for, for modeling health. Scale. The um, human being has always been the scale of design for cities for, for thousands of years. Not the car. The car is important, yes, it's very handy and so forth, but it's not what drives the scale of cities. This is the city of Vancouver, and um, it's usually ranked in the top you know, few cities in the world when everyone, anyone does a, a ranking like that. And they had the option of building highways and so forth through the city, and they opted not to in the 70s. They, they, um, they thought uh, they had a different vision for their, their city and now it's a very nice place. But they're never quite satisfied. They, they never talk about balance in Vancouver. When you talk to their planners and engineers, they talk about priorities. They look at their vision and they see where they're lacking and they set priorities and they, they go after those priorities. They're not trying to achieve a balance because whenever they, they make advancements, they just reset their priorities and keep moving forward. And they put their resources behind their priorities. So if it's advancing pedestrians or transit or whatnot, they put those priorities ahead of other things and put their money and resources and so forth behind it. Speed is hugely important and, and, we're, and people sometimes worry about throughput 
for, for motorists with lower speeds, but you can actually move you know, at, at fairly low speeds you know, a, lot of, a lot of traffic. So it's, I think it's kind of an unfounded idea that low speeds means no throughput. <coughs> but the idea is that when people are driving through your context, they're going through on your terms and not on some sort of arbitrary highway type terms. And there's lots of books being written about this now and, and guidelines by you know, various engineers and planners from around the country. This one was done by the Congress for the New Urbanism and the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Uh, there's a smart transportation guidebook prepared by the New Jersey DOT and the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. And these aren't some kind of left-leaning, tree-hugging groups. These are um, you know, engineers who have to run transportation departments. And, and they're encouraging this sort of thing because it makes a lot of sense um, for quality of life, for tax base, and for them, it's less expensive. They cannot afford to keep doing what they were doing. And so with the, with the, um, the budgets being so tight, they're finding context sense of design, complete streets, smart transportation is making a whole lot of sense. And so in these guidelines, you'll, you'll find diagrams like this, where in the old days, conventionally, we would design this, the streets as being really fast and then po arbitrarily post them at slower speeds. And, as, and then we were surprised when people drove quickly. I think there's an emerging consensus that we post we, um, and we design and we operate at the, the same speed. And so from your community's perspective, you ought to think about what sorts of behaviors you want on your street. What speed does that mean? And then design for that speed and post for that speed so that it's all consistent. So notice that these are all equal and, and those aren't. Um, the city of Los Angeles just produced this model street designs, designs that any city can use and adopt. They're available for free in Word and in InDesign. And you can just take these things and um, edit them for your own city. There's really good information. It was written by people from all over North America, so it's not LA focus, it's sort of North American focus. And in there's some very exciting stuff. So um, these are called framework streets. These are the big arterial roads. And there's all sorts of things in green that you're allowed to do, which some people will tell you you're not allowed to do. And then of course on the, the smaller streets, the, um, the collectors and the local street, there's lots of things you can do too. But there's um, I'm going to leave this, um, this PowerPoint behind, but um, if you, I, I don't want to go away from the microphone, but um, you know, from narrowing this, the street to removing lanes to narrowing lanes to um, changing shoulders to all kinds of things are available to change the design of streets to make them more inclusive and, and people friendly. And then of course on the little streets, you know, there's all sorts of things as well, but the, um, which I think is pretty well understood. I think the arterial and the collectors are the ones that um, yeah, require the most focus tonight. So walkable environments, uh, we want our streets to be walkable, but what does that even mean? Um, well, there's a beach, which is walkable, and there's a, an urban waterfront, which is walkable. What makes this walkable? Um, what's the minimum criteria for walkability? And one is it's comfortable. You can, you know, you feel safe. You can walk along there forever. It's engaging, can hold your interest, um, and it's accessible to the person um, walking. With those three things, um, that is considered walkable, and this is considered walkable. But that's not enough for a city. You, you need more than, more than that. Things need to be convenient to be walkable. Land uses need to be mixed in such a way that you can get what you need you know, fairly closely. And they need to be connected. You need multiple routing options between different things to have a walkable city. Does anybody recognize that? <coughs> Just shut it out. It's a horse. Okay, very good. Maybe we'll get a door prize for whoever gets the most right answers. So that's a horse. Has anyone ever seen a horse skeleton before? But you knew it was a horse. Okay, good. How about that? What's that? Close. It's not a dolphin, but it's a manatee. 
So these two animals have lungs, hearts, kidneys, livers, um, tons of similarities. They both eat grass, they both breathe air, but because of their bone structure, they, um, they operate completely differently, completely different outcomes. Here are the bone structures of two cities. This one is highly walkable and this one is completely car dependent, just because of the, the bone structure. Both of them have houses, both of them have offices, both of them have open space, but because of the structure of this city, it's walkable. Anybody know where that is? Santa, okay, anyone know where that is? Yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? Um, it's actually Irvine, California. So you, you can tell that it, Irvine is a miserable city just by looking at its x-ray. <laughs> so the point is, if you want walkable streets, it's much easier to walk around on a network of streets. It's kind of like going upstairs. With a dendritic hierarchy, with a grapevine type hierarchy, with um, big arterials and so forth, it's really hard to get across. It's kind of like going up big stairs. It's, it's hard to do. The car carrying capacity of the street um, isn't proportional to the number of through lanes. So on a, let's take this one. Uh, with through lanes with left turns, uh, the average through lane can carry about a thousand cars or so. But when you add an extra through lane, you would think it would double the car carrying capacity. But it doesn't. It, it's more, but it's not double. This is the marginal increase right here. If you add a third through lane, the increase is a little less again. So you're much better off with two two-lane roads than one four-lane road from a car carrying perspective. The, the ability to do a context-sensitive street or a complete street is much easier with two-lane streets than four-lane streets. So when you're doing your network, um, Try and emphasize a, a, uh, a network of smaller streets and, and lots of them. So this, these um, five two-lane streets will carry a whole lot more traffic than these streets, even though the same lane miles. And there's, there's also lots of ways to turn left. There's great access to property. This can be highly walkable and, and bikeable. Um, so this is the kind of thing we need to avoid if we want to do complete streets. And then when you have a sparse network, all the traffic has to use the, the big road here. You've got multiple routing options and you've got lots of different land uses within you know, relatively short um, trips. These take much longer trips. So the, the trips are longer and they're all using the same road. And so that tends to make more automobile oriented roads. This tends to make an environment conducive to walking, cycling, and, and so forth. Hello, mixed land use and density reduced my average weekend trip length by about 85%. So this guy, this guy's got it figured out, doesn't he? Um, and the same thing with land use. If you get everything you need within a short range, you don't have to move very much, which is really efficient um, use of space. So here's a breakdown of what we do to travel. Um, we have all these different uses um, and only about 20% of our travel has to do with work but we always obsess about the work trip but if we can get most of these things within close proximity through through density and through mixing land uses we don't have to travel very far which is um, a whole lot more efficient the trips are shorter and they're more likely to be done on foot and by bike This is a grocery store behind a parking lot, and this is a grocery store up to the street. So which one lends itself to complete streets? You know, clearly this one, because you can actually access the building from the sidewalk. This is a, a, a drugstore behind a parking lot, and this is one up to a street. Same thing. This is self-storage. Yike. And that's self-storage up to the street. You know, quite walkable, actually. And that's actually on a state arterial. Um, and so it doesn't matter what density, there's this relationship of buildings to streets um, needs to be up to the street. So don't allow anyone ever to build a parking lot between their building and the street anymore and require the door to be on the front. And you'll get walkable environments at, even at low densities and at higher densities. 
Obviously, at higher densities, the, <clears throat> the probability of trips being shorter is a lot higher. And so all that's fine for cities, but what about a downtown and a main street? We've got to raise the bar a little further. So we talk about vibrancy when we talk about main streets. So here's a vibrant main street. This is um, Broad Street in um, Richmond, Virginia. Look at all the social exchange going on and all the economic exchange with all the shops. Uh, public transit, uh, cars, um, using the street. So the litmus test for everything we're talking about, does the change reward the short trip and or the transit trip? And, and clearly, this environment does. And how they, they pulled it off was, this is a map of Richmond, and, and there's a street, and you see the little white kind of boundary around each of the streets? That's the catchment areas for the trolleys, within a walking distance of the trolleys. So every citizen in Richmond was in a close walk to a transit line or to where they were going. So they were awarding the short trip and the transit trip until 1949, when they abandoned that idea and started rewarding the long trip, rewarding high levels of service for motorists, reducing delays for motorists, speeding up their roads, which ended up exporting their people out of the city to places further away, making their streets car dependent. So now that's, that's the same view today. They've completely ironed out all of the social and economic exchange by rewarding the long trip and the car trip as opposed to the short trip and the transit trip. So here, this is a little cartoon of two streets and we're going to talk a little bit about average trip length. So I just widen the street so we can see what's going on. And those red lines represent a trip. So that's one trip from here to here. And, there's, and these ones are shorter. So pretend these are one mile long and these are maybe average of four miles long. So you can see there's about four times as many trips on that because they're shorter than on here. But if we were to do a traffic count at any part here, there's three trips, right? One, two, three, and one, two, three. So that from a traffic perspective, they look the same, but there's four times more trip making happening on, on that side, and people getting off and on, getting into driveways. And some of these trips aren't even, they don't even cross the, um, the tubes to be counted. You know, they're on and off before you even get to the tube. These get double counted and triple counted as, as people go long distances, but still the same amount of traffic four times the trips. And we keep obsessing about traffic volumes in cities, but think about trip, average trip length. That's probably even more important than the volume. So here are two networks. Let's say we're looking at these two streets. Everything else is the same. Um, there's 18,000 um, volume on each street. But let's say on the left, the average trip length is two miles and the average trip length on the right is six. So there's three times the trip making going on here. So there's more vibrancy. There's more economic exchange going on, more work trips, um, more social exchange going on. Chances are um, this is more successful economically and socially uh, than this place. Let's change things. Let's say we take that same strip, that same street, and through policy, we decide to reward the long trip. So we, we pre prevent uh, left turns, for example. Let's say we one-way a few streets to speed things up, simplify signal timing, and that kind of thing. And let's say the volume then goes up to 20,000. So we've got almost over a 10% increase in, in traffic on the street. And, and some people will equate that to uh, you know, more opportunity and so forth. Let's say on this street we put in, in parking and, um, and the volumes go down. But at the same time, if we understood trip length, maybe the trip length on here went to one mile and this is now eight. So now there's six times the, the trips happening here than on here. Far more vibrancy going on, far more economic and social exchange happening, far better place from a city perspective with less traffic. And so planners reward the short trip and transit trip through density changes, mixing land uses, bringing buildings up to the street. Transportation people can do it by, by um, two-way, one-way streets, by 
um, slowing streets down by allowing all the different turn movements. And, and this ends up being a much more efficient city. It's more compact, the trips are le less, there's far less energy being used when you're only going short distances. The other thing that happens too, when we start reducing our average trip length, more of those trips get converted to walking and cycling. So it's more conducive to a complete streets um, approach. So that's about main streets and then ideally the, the place is safe and legible but I, I won't go into that, that kind of thing in detail. So remember I, I grew up in Ottawa and then I moved to the West Palm Beach to head up their transportation division. And this is what I came to. I left probably one of the safest cities in North America and ended up in the place where HBO did a documentary on drug abuse and uh, prostitution called Undercover USA Crack America. It was filmed right here in West Palm Beach. And um, I was in charge of the streets and my predecessors had busily spit, sped up those roads, widened them, narrowed the sidewalks, took the parking off, one-wayed them, um, uh, encouraging everybody with choice to leave the city to the suburbs. Those folks became car dependent and drove back through our city or into our city and then we had to build parking lots to accommodate them. Um, we knocked down most of our fabric buildings to accommodate these cars which ruined our walkability and our, our biking even more and we hit rock bottom when we had seven thousand dollars. There was buy your crack here spray painted on the side of some buildings. It was, it was deplorable. And this is where the people went, to the Everglades. And so there's development and there's Everglades. And it was all made possible by these fast roads out of the city um, you know, so the people could leave. And so then they, in return, bombed our city with, with traffic. <coughs> and you could probably imagine this sort of thing here with you know, development that's happened further out, people cutting through your city you know, to get to other places or get to your city. And so this is what happened to, to West Palm Beach. All that white space is vacant land, or land that got turned into parking lots. The black spots are the remaining buildings. So we, um, we really inhibited walking. Um, and this is what it looked like. It was just um, boarded up buildings, empty, empty sites where buildings used to be. Kind of depressing. And we weren't, oh yeah, the experts said we weren't allowed to develop in here because of concurrency. And we had congestion because we had 30% of the jobs, but we only had 8% um, of the population. We had a lot of land, and we wanted to develop this land, but you're not allowed to develop unless public infrastructure is provided concurrently. That's what concurrency means. So sewers, schools, roads. And because our streets were, were congested, we weren't allowed to develop. So we had to live with this. this was, this was required. We couldn't build a building here if we wanted to. If we wanted to build a building here, we had to widen one of those already really wide roads, making them even less complete than they already were. So we, we got a concurrent, well, the, the mayor really believed in this, and we did this big, huge outreach effort, and we met with everybody to get a, um, a consensus on a vision, and we, we, we documented it, we drew it, and, and this is what we wanted our city to look like. So we got a concurrency exception area, which meant we didn't have to worry about levels of service for motorists anymore. It, we didn't even have to talk about it if we didn't want to. And we, and we codified all of this in our, in our legislation. So my job was to figure out what to do with these enormous roads. Um, you can see the weeds growing out of the broken windows here, this abandoned building. You know, this is the kind of environment we were, were in. Look at the, the anti-walking facilities over here. And so I decided to narrow the roads and build raised intersections. Now at the time, it was the mid-90s, and I'd only been out of school for 10 years, and I, I really didn't know what to do. There was no, the road diet had not been coined yet, the term. Um, contact sense of solutions hadn't been coined yet. Um, complete streets had not been coined yet. But I knew that that was wrong. And um, so I did a road diet and made it more complete, I guess, in retrospect. And we put raised intersections at the intersections. And, and people said you couldn't build them at signals, but we, we did, and it worked fine. This is a four-lane commuter route cutting the, the neighborhood in half. And um, 
we made it a two-lane commuter route with a, um, a trail along the waterfront. Um, and it got used right away. And this is a five-lane state arterial that cut this neighborhood in half. And we made it into a two-lane street with wide sidewalks. And we you can see it's under construction. There's room for a bike lane on each side. At the two elementary schools on that arterial, we raised the intersections so that the kids could cross the street easily. So now we have a complete street where there wasn't one before. This is a state arterial, one-way, high-speed road going through the college. And there, the college was going to put these pedestrian flyovers here because it was so hostile. Instead, we narrowed the street, we made it two-way, we beautified it, tightened it up, and um, did these raised crossings. And, and the school dropped its plans to build the flyovers because we sewed the campus back together with a complete street. This is our main street. It was a one-way street, just horrible. Uh, empty of businesses and we, we two-wayed it and beautified it and at the end of the street there was signals with turn lanes. We took out the turn lanes, we took out the signals, we raised it up to sidewalk height, made it into a walkable, bikeable, friendly place. We, we did things for the kids. And keep in mind this is where drug dealers and prostitutes used to, to hang out and we introduced cool, safe activities into those areas which cleaned them up nicely. We, we provided places for people to sit. You know, this isn't Complete Streets is about being comfortable. This is an empty, burnt out old building. Nobody feels comfortable walking past there, even if the street was gorgeous, uh, between the buildings. So we had to fix up the, the building. So we gave this guy a facade grant and he fixed up the outside of his building. And he fixed up the inside himself. He f managed to figure that out. And then now there's a waiting list to get in there. And so where prostitutes used to hang out, um, now they can enjoy a nice lunch at one of the restaurants. <laughs> Here's a um, really big mixed-use uh, building, the, and this is um, a street project that we're doing at the same time. Now the models said, the county and the MPO you had the models, and the models said that we had to widen this road because of the, you know, the huge increases in density. And so here we are narrowing the road. We didn't have transit or anything like that, but we believed that if we made streets that were walkable, bikeable, friendly, and beautiful, that it would change people's behaviors and change the city. Um, a grocery store came in. Um, this is on the waterfront. Um, this, we replaced the old bridge, it was sinking. We replaced it with this bridge and we built this um, path. And we have an interchange for bikes and pedestrians. You can get everywhere on this bridge. Um, easily on your bike without crossing one car lane. And so there's, um, we brought in some full-sized oak trees and created instant ambiance on that bridgehead. And so now it's a, it's a ped bike mecca down there. This is um, an infill development. And so we plan to do this mixed-use development here and, and I had to figure out what to do with the, the streets. And, and it was pretty intense development. And again, the model said that we had to make this intersection um, have left turn lanes. If we didn't have left turn lanes, this thing would get totally congested. Now, if you look at that building here, it's that building. So that's the after picture. This is the before and after. So we, you can see the, the land use is much more intense. Notice there's no left turn lanes. I decided that it was too important to have a walkable environment to put left turn lanes in. So it's again setting one's priorities. And yeah, yeah, there's a little backup for the motorists, but they don't mind. It's in a great place. The models assume that the only thing that matters to motorists is getting through fast. The quality of the trip is hugely important. People go out of their way to come here because it's cool. Here's one of the buildings um, in that area. Now when I took this picture, I had to wa watch out for rusty syringes and used condoms and stuff on the ground. This was in the heart of the Crack America area. <clears throat> and that turned to that uh, because we made it an inclusive place where people could go. Now it's, it's not as easy to blow through here in your car, but people, people will find their way here. This is a really great case study. Um, this is the Rockville Pike. Uh, busy, busy road north of Washington, D.C. Um, spurred on all kinds of sprawl. And, and, the, and the people that live there want to, to, to 
change that. Now, they actually have a, uh, a metro station up here. And there's the metro station. But look at the built form. It's all first generation, surface part, car oriented type um, land, very suburban land uses. Um, I think it, um, a lot of it probably came before the metro did, yeah. And, um, and this is what it looks like. You know, just completely um, car oriented, uh, not, not friendly to pedestrians or cyclists. Completely ADA deficient. And this is the sorts of land uses on the side. It's really hard to get to. You know, this could be anywhere in, in the country. It's, it's pretty ugly. So these um, property owners that are in color were really frustrated because they wanted to redevelop their land and, and do higher densities and mixed use and couldn't because the, the street couldn't handle any more traffic. So they hired us to um, try and figure out what to do. And the first thing we did was an x-ray of the place and we noticed all kinds of errors in the network and we, we fixed them such that there's many more east-west routing options and many more north-south routing options, which allows the streets all to become smaller and more inclusive, complete streets. And so when we, now there are good times for modeling and this is one of them. And so we, we modeled the before and after and the after showed a much more um, sharing of the loads amongst many of the, the new intersections. So each street sharing its own part of the, the traffic there in that commercial area. <coughs> Because of the network, these are the um, five and 10 minute uh, walking contours, the catchment area um, for the metro has increased dramatically because of the uh, more direct access to the metro. And then of course, we were rewarding the short trip and the transit trip, and so there's the, the metro station. We're doing a, a bus rapid transit line and then a little trolley line and creating a wonderful catchment um, for transit in the area. So. Getting back to the Rockville Pike, it, we, with all of that effort, with the network and, and so forth, we can now design a complete street. So we have you know, the transit down the middle. We have 18 foot wide sidewalks with a uh, protected bike lane, um, nice bulb outs. We have a double row of trees on the edge, a double row of trees down the middle, and a double row of trees on the other edge. So it's gonna be a really beautiful, comfortable street. And that's an arterial road, and arterial roads historically have been the best addresses in cities. And when they were just sped up and treated as car conduits, they became the worst addresses and became barriers in the community. This is going to return the arterial back to its rightful role in this community of being a, a very inclusive, uh, vibrant place. Um, and then from a cycling perspective, obviously there's space to, for the cyclist. And then you can build refuges at intersections in between to get folks across the street. So here's, a, here's one that was done in paint. Um, this road probably carried about 23,000 cars. It's Edgewater. And, and just with the paint job, um, great things started to happen. Oh, some of the intersections are, are slowly getting uh, bulb outs. Bit new businesses are opening up. Um, they're starting to have festivals. This used to be a barrier in this community. Now it's the center of the community again, just, just with a paint job. There's all this stuff going on. A lot of value added to the area. Crashes went down 146 to 87 a year. Injuries went down even more. Speeds went down, all very positive things in the community. Um, and then, and it correlates to the experiences of other cities. So, you know, Seattle has big uh, collision reductions as well. And, and this shows all kinds of road diets from around the country and the changes in volume. Some go up, some go down. Um, here's a five lane arterial going through part of San Diego. It was narrowed to two lanes um, with bike lanes and, and parking. Lots of vibrancy going on. Uh, people being all across the street. And it was done through roundabouts. The roundabouts don't need all those storage lanes and so forth. So the, they didn't need five lanes, they only needed two. And um, so they, the space was recycled for better purposes. You know, parking, bike lanes, wide sidewalks. And so this old lady can comfortably ride her bike in her community again when she wouldn't dare ride her bike before. Um, sidewalks, um, in, in a fixed use type environment, there's 
different spaces for different things, all the furniture, where you walk. One of the things that I think is really important is make driveways look like driveways. Have the sidewalk go through at the sidewalk level and um, keep the material intact. Put a contrasting color apron because this is not a street. It shouldn't look like a street. And when it looks like a street, it's telling drivers that they're more important than, than pedestrians. So here's, here's one that's done okay, I guess. There's, there's the sidewalk, there's the apron. This one's not done very well. A, this is just an alley. It, it doesn't deserve, the pedestrians don't deserve to have to go down to alley level to get back up. The, the, the alley driver should come over and then down. This symbolizes Shero, the ancient Egyptian goddess of efficiency. She encouraged the powerful to willingly share the earth for their own health and that of society. So sharing, you know, when you don't have enough space, sometimes it's good to share. And so this symbol is just a, a means of communicating to, to motorists that um, you're going to have to share this road with uh, cyclists. And you know, on a hill, you know, in the downhill, when you don't have enough space, sometimes you just use a share on the uphill, you put the bike lane where people are going slowly, you know, that kind of thing. Here's a, um, a shero with, and it was reinforced with this green paint. And so these ladies are quite happily chitter chattering you know, on a very busy road. So they're comfortably driving, they're riding their bikes. So there's all kinds of ways of doing bike lanes. Um, there's just painted ones. These are concrete bike lanes. The issue I have with these is the um, kind of the th thump, the thump, the thump thing you get with the, the um, grooves. The expansion joints, it's, it's a lot smoother to ride on the, to the road. So, but they're nice and conspicuous. They, they, they show up nicely. This, this is made out of asphalt and it's got, it's just printed, but the, um, when you're riding on it, you actually don't feel the texture. It just, um, it just looks nice and tells drivers, you know, to drive over here and it optically narrows the street a little bit. This one's done in a little bit of um, paver. That can be fairly smooth, but you feel it a little bit. This one's kind of cool. That's a very um, bumpy brick street, but you have a nice smooth concrete bike lane. And this is saw cut, so you don't get the um, differences in elevation at the joints. So that's a, re that's a really nice way of doing a concrete bike lane. Here's a, a valley gutter between the parking and the street combined with a, a bike lane. This one's built up a little bit. Um, some people think that these things need to be built up so that drivers don't go in them very much. You, know, you, can, you can see this being an advantage or disadvantage depending if you want to get off of it or on of it, onto it with your bike. But this is a little kind of bike way through this block. Um, that's part of that trail I just talked about. And then there's these bike roads at um, University of Santa Barbara, or sorry, University of California in Santa Barbara. They've got these bike streets with bike roundabouts. And so they've got incredibly high um, uh, bike use in that, in that university. So when we did the university's transportation master plan, we actually ended up doubling this network of bicycle facilities. So now we get into shared spaces. There's some much more sharing. So this is in Italy. And there's parking, cycling, motorists, um, pedestrians all in this space and and this is like the efficiency apartment right everything happens in the same space same with this space same with that space all very successful uh, safe places now this is different they could have employed fixed-use thinking here they could have built sidewalks planter strips parking lanes bike lanes car lanes turn lanes here but they chose not to. They chose to build a big shared space. And everybody gets along quite well because of the, the good design. There's business people eating lunch, there's tourists, there's parking, there's dining. All that stuff is happening in the same space. Here's a, a huge plaza in, um, I can't remember which Scandinavian country it is in. But anyway, large area, uh, totally shared by pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, quite equitably. People with disabilities can get around. They can shut this down and have big events. It's um, very, very flexible. This is a very busy main street. And so this is where the motorists are concentrated. Then they have what's called comfort zones on the sides where the motorists aren't really allowed and, and you can walk, but you can walk anywhere. 
and there's some loading going on. You know, people with mobility impairments can get around, cyclists can get around. You know, it's, it's a truly equitable, uh, safe environment. Now here's a before picture of an intersection. Traffic engineers obsess about controlling their, the, the environments of the public. And so this is where you walk and they tell you how fast you can drive, where you can cross, when you can cross, how you drive. Um, and this is what they're replacing it with, with a kind of a modified roundabout. And it's all shared. Cyclists and pedestrians are going all over here. Very comfortable shared space. This used to be a conventional intersection and now it's a, a shared space. You can see the, the guy on the bike and the car talking. There's some dining over here. There's some art in the middle. Um, people just walk and cycle through here quite readily. This is Davis Square in 10 years. <coughs> Notice there's different angle streets coming in from all over the place. It's a very busy street with lots of pedestrians and shops. Um, very safe. There used to be crashes. It used to be designed um, like Davis Square is now, where the traffic engineer decides how fast you go, when you go, what light turns green, where you cross, you know, where the bulb outs are, where you can dine and so forth. All of this was figured out for the turning radius of the trucks and all this kind of thing. It was all prescribed from uh, up top. And this was the, what they replaced it with. This, was, this is the unsafe design. This is the one that caused crashes. There's been no crashes since this was built. It's on a major bus route, very busy intersection. This is in Jacksonville Beach, completely flush environment. Um, the idea is to attract investment um, on the sides. It's an economic investment strategy. Sorry about the blurry picture, but that's the Google Earth image of a town in tech or city in Texas. This is the uh, old courthouse square. It's part of a state truck route, that, and it's one-way street. So one-way street comes up here and goes up here and then comes back this way. And um, everybody left downtown and moved out to the uh, highway bypass, and they turned the uh, square into a big parking lot to compete with the suburbs. And, and, it, and it just fell on really, really hard times. It was just like a, a hollowed out place. The main street is up here, and it looks, this is the main street. Just a dilapidated, place with no investment going on. So our first project was to do the main street and that's the main street now. It's a hugely vibrant place with investment coming in. Uh, we built, it's 50 feet of right of way, but we built what we think is a beautiful, complete street. And um, there's, there's all kinds of uh, building permits and stuff going on in there. Uh, well, right now they're doing it. In this picture, they're doing a um, farmer's market, but. It, no, it's open. Um, and then, so now we're doing the square. And so you can see it's still under construction as we speak. But this entire, we two-wayed all the streets. You know, it's a very complicated um, square with all of these streets coming in at weird angles and everything. But we, we two-wayed them all, and we made them all flush. There's no vertical curbs anymore in this whole environment. And we looked at the vistas, and we placed... Um, you know, the war memorials and stuff in the right places. We've placed things for the, mm -hmm. the kids. And people discovered it spontaneously. This happens to be an event, but people started using the space while it was still under construction. This has got to be, I think, one of the coolest squares in the, the United States. It's set up for every size event. You can see the stage up here. It's built on this street. All, everything's set up for big events or little events. You can go there and just have a little birthday party or a July 4th. And you might have, the, the, you know, we built the freaking coolest square anywhere. And what made national news but the bathrooms. So these are the um, glass bathrooms. When you're in them, you can see out completely. All the, the walls are glass and they're, they're mirrored. So you can only see out, you can't see in. And, the, and it's kind of neat. Um, these became a tourist attraction. People come from all over to check out the two bathrooms. <laughs> now, now, the bathrooms um, are something hard to plan for public spaces, you know, because, you know, all the issues that go with bathrooms, right? But we thought, okay, let's make them a feature. And so these are the first two transparent bathrooms in the United States. There's two of them on this square. And, and for every 10 people that visit the bathrooms, only 
two go to the bathroom. The other eight are just checking out the bathroom because it's so cool. This is up in Canada. Uh, this is the first roundabout in Mississauga. This is a, a college a building. Uh, we, we did the master plan for this college and that's the first building to come out of the ground. And here's our, our flush uh, street kind of shared space in one of the quads. So when you look out the window, this is gonna be a, like a parkland type thing connecting through here. Um, so this street connects the two parks. So the students are gonna stream across that street back and forth um, and because of the, the deflections and the art that's gonna be going in here and, and the landscaping, it's gonna be a very, very inclusive space. This is, um, and by the way, it's gonna be a lot easier to plow the snow without all those curbs all over the place. Now this is back in Florida at University of Central Florida. I think it's the third largest or fourth largest university in the country now. And this is their main shopping street right next to their, their plaza in front of the, um, the arena and we built it with no curbs. Um, so people in wheelchairs and, and pedestrians and so forth can just get around here in a completely seamless way and they do and the cars go through there really respectfully and really slowly. This is a much busier street in downtown Orlando. This is the new um, basketball arena. I guess it's not all that new anymore but anyway there's plenty of traffic and there's no curbs and so pedestrians and, and cars share that space. There's that nice, it's very beautiful at night, um, and when events happen, it's, it's a happening, um, active place. And then up in Michigan, we were there last week um, working on this campus plan, and there's the, the new library, and there's the student center, and there's this tremendous amount of pedestrian traffic crossing this street, and um, they're having a real hard time crossing the street. So instead of having the students cross the street, we're going to be building a a kind of a square kind of plaza in here and the cars will be driving through the square or plaza and uh, so they'll be entering the pedestrian realm <clears throat> on that you know fairly busy street so that's a whole pile of ideas coming at you incredibly quickly um, but it kind of introduces you to the kind of the breadth of complete streets and how um, how it's related to everything from network to economic development to to visions, to um, you, you name it. And so with that, perhaps we can um, discuss any um, things you want to talk about or if you have any questions or anything. Yes, ma'am.